Right, guys, thank you very much for, for having me here today. I'll just extend my gratitude to, to Cam, Bim, uh, and Helen for the introduction. I wasn't rem remotely sort of overselling the, uh, the information that I'm going to impart on you guys today. Um, I've been watching with, with uh, anticipation at the sort of the development of Cam, Bim, and, and, and the discussion, uh, regular discussions with Helen uh, across the water around the, the interesting things that are sort of starting to happen over here. Uh, and so it's, it's with, with great sort of anticipation that I, that I come here today to, to talk to you about a bit about the UK context, a little bit about our, our projects in the UK and how we're integrating that, that whole process of digital information management within um, a lot of the research and practice based projects that we're, are currently underway. Um, I'll start with a bit of context first about how we are where we are. So currently in the UK, 10% of the workforce is employed in, in construction, and that also includes the allied supply chains and maintenance industries. There's a wider economic impact of, of, of that body, and that's up to £600 billion pounds per annum. It's been calculated at. And what's, what's really interesting is that in the last industrial strategy in the UK, construction was actually named within this. So we ended up getting a UK construction sector deal, and that was £170 million pounds to invest over four years with a £250 million match funding from industry and the development of a sustainable uh, long-term model. The, the, the direction and the ambitions of that UK construction sector deal were not alien to you guys in terms of global movements and concepts around construction and the future of construction, but it's for better performing buildings. It's to lower energy use in buildings better jobs and, and more highly skilled jobs within the UK workforce and better value for taxpayers and investors, as well as creating a globally competitive sector to target what is potentially a two and a half trillion um, global market. So the longer term um, aims and objectives of that construction sector deal were to lower the costs, a reduction in the initial costs of construction by 33% was Alongside that was also to have a 50% faster delivery and a 50% reduction in carbon emissions. There's also a, an outline uh, goal there to have a 50% improvement uh, in, our, in our export rate. The one thing that we need to do in the UK to be able to actually execute this, and a number of different bodies have looked at this, and the advice is the same, and it's by no means uh, a small piece of advice. They call for root and branch reform of the entire sector um, with, with three key strategic outcomes in mind. The first is, is delivering better and more certain outcomes using digital technologies. The second is focused on manufacturing to improve productivity. We can increase the quality and safety of our built assets um, through a manufacturing approach to construction in comparison to some of the traditional methods that we've used previously. And then finally, third, all of these build up to this, it's an increase in performance, an optimization of the whole um, through life performance of that built asset. And I'll move on in a moment to talk about what's really started to manifest from this advice and a number of different gov government documentations, which is the focus on a golden thread of information and being able to evidence a golden thread of digital information and how we can actually begin to apply that to a project in the stages that we're at. In terms of what's driven this change, there's a growing, um, it's, it's incredibly exciting marketplace at the minute in construction. The, the rate of change is absolutely rapid. I don't need to tell you guys this. Environmental health, the narratives around global environmental health are ongoing and increasing. We've also got within this nexus, this narrative around social health and the delivery of social value. Um, and then all the while we've got technological disruption and digital growth. All these three things together should be that nexus for creating that golden thread of information. But it actually took quite a tragedy with the Grenfell Tower fire on June the 14th um, and the loss of 74 people's lives to make the industry wake up and to make government wake up and really focus on how will we embed that cultural change and that root and branch reform within the construction industry. They commissioned uh, Dame Judith Hackett to write the Hackett Report, also known 
as the Building a Safer Future report, uh, an independent review of building regulations and fire safety. One of the most damning things to come out of this report, and I say one of them because there's quite a few uh, pointed and leveled at our industry, is that we absolutely have a value problem. Um, we still attach and see value and the notion of value within our industry as all about cost and cost savings. And Judith Hackett really, really levels um, the challenge to the industry here to reframe our notions of value around longer term notions of value, around societal health, around environmental health, um, and improving the quality of the built asset and the cities and the environments that those built assets sit within, as opposed to the current trajectory, which is short termism and profiteering. <coughs> So she, she basically says in this document that people are looking for quick fixes. That's all they're interested in. Um, but what we do need to understand is that this root and branch reform is absolutely required and it will bring about a cultural change. Prior to this report and prior to the beginning of this movement, I think it would be very fair to say that we had no mission, no vision, and therefore we have no values as an industry within the UK. Um, at the same time as this, and released only a month later, was a whole report called Procuring for Value, uh, which was fantastic. It was done by the Construction Leadership Council, um, a great, great, wonderful colleague of mine called um, Anne Bentley it was the author of this. And this Procuring for Value document was about outcome-based, transparent and efficient industries. Um, it was a whole life integrate to create whole life integrated industry which will improve productivity and end user satisfaction and produce wider societal benefits. All of the government agendas and all the funding attached to them in the UK at the moment must be able to evidence that added value step. She also observed in this document that the single overwhelming observation was a systematic lack of joined up action within the industry. And this was attributed in part to a systematic lack of joined up information within the industry. And both Anne Bentley and Dame Judith Hackett are positioning for this thread of information to be instilled within construction so that we can make the process more transparent, we can make people more accountable and ultimately create a, a sector that is more ethical in its business behaviour. Um, the benefits to her are incredibly clear. It's about whole life efficiency, it's about economies of scale, it's about the quality improvements, the health and safety improvements that can be delivered through standardization and manufacturing approaches to construction, as well as the opportunities that embracing digital technology offers. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about them later. The Procuring for Value framework has three priorities. The first is to use an outcome-based procurement method to drive capital program delivery and lifetime performance. In essence, all this really means is a much more intelligent client briefing process. Engaging the owner occupier and the client at the very beginning of a project to set some very key evaluation criteria and metrics that are adhered to throughout the project and that the entire <coughs> design and construction team are held to account to all the way through that project and throughout the life cycle after that project wants handover. The second priority was to increase transparency on the performance of suppliers and built assets. And the third was to improve the procurement efficiency and get the basics right first before we get the business right. This is obviously all going on in the, in the sort of shadow of, of, of BIM mandates that, have, that have, you're all probably familiar with that have been spread across the UK. We have still not leveraged by any means the full potential of the data at our disposal, um, despite the mandates. They've, the difference in rollouts has been very interesting in terms of what we can learn between the Scottish rollout and the rest of the UK. Scotland, uh, we have a lot more to learn from what Scotland have done right and a lot more to learn about what the rest of the UK have done wrong. Uh, and some of those key lessons that have come from Scotland is that they actively developed a really strong communications and engagement strategy to engage all levels of the supply chain in the rollout before the rollout. Um, this eventually came within the wider UK rollout, but after the rollout. Um, the Scottish model had the ability to flex information requirements depending on project complexity. Um, it also actively sort of resisted death by acronym 
and the creation of, uh, promoted the creation of usable and understandable terminology. So this, a lot of this was really learning from what the rest of the UK had done wrong. BIM was becoming a lot more of a silo in the rest of the UK. And the Scottish government really sort of focused on how to break that down, how to communicate and get it much more accessible. They focused on getting the basics right, uh, communicating those very well first through naming conventions, workflow, information and examples on collaborative working practices. And I stress the final point on collaborative working practices, and I'll come back to that later because I think that is the crux of successful rollout of any form of BIM mandate. Um, they, if anyone hasn't seen this, the Scottish Futures Trust have a website called BIM, the BIM Portal. It's probably the best, globally I would say, in my opinion, the best BIM resource that I've seen to enable people at all levels of the supply chain to understand all of the terminology around BIM, to understand and access a variety of tools and a suite of tools to enable you to grade your project so you understand what level of requirement it should have and what that actually means in terms of the program. Um, they have a number of benefit tools, including a return on investment tool. Um, so it, it, it's a really, really good resource. It's full of templates, checklists, and tutorial videos as well. The background of, of all of this information is, is what do we do with it? And, and can we actually stitch it into some form of ordered um, sequence? And that is this golden thread of building information. It's, in terms of definition, it's defined as the design, creation, and maintenance of a digital record of a building. And in UK government parlance, it's to ensure that the original design intent and any subsequent changes to the building are monitored, recorded, and preserved for the future occupation and maintenance of the building. It's key to enabling people inheriting the risk to understand how a building operates what the layers of protection exist and what needs to be done in order that any risk is managed or mitigated so far as is reasonably practical going forward. But the fundamentals of that golden thread of information are very similar to the fundamentals and those original aspirations of rolling out building information modeling in the original mandate. It's to drive greater openness, to drive greater transparency and to create more accountability within our industry. We've set about uh, a recent project with uh, an all-star cast of, of UK construction partners from the Design Council to the Ministry of Building Innovation and Education and Public Health England on trying to define the stages of what a golden thread should be in terms of design, manufacture, installation and operation. There's four overarching stages. And what makes up each of these stages with regards to design rules energy rules, costing rules, and the information that we need to populate an accessible and open and transparent thread of information on a project. This is all over, overseen and underpinned in some respects by the sentiment of Anne Bentley's procurement of value framework that is focused on delivering value and being able to evaluate success of a project and also through building performance evaluation so that we can quantitatively evaluate the success of the project. A very sort of high level in terms of the way that we've communicated this project because we've chosen a social housing platform to deliver this on first was once we have this information it's incredibly easy to use as, as some of you will be aware incredibly easy to use that 3D model and that information around cost energy performance to engage people more meaningfully and stakeholders more meaningfully in terms of co-design and participatory design exercises and activities, we start with conversation. We use the technology to underpin that. We start with those workshops. We create that situation, that environment where we can say these are objectives and we will evaluate this project against those objectives at four or five stages throughout the project. And that is the procuring for value methodology. The second stage and the second use of this golden thread is that we get a much more reliable data set around energy modeling. We understand the U values, we understand the operational energy, the waste of a particular method of construction. And we can also um, very easily highlight the cost benefit of going with a lesser, um, a lesser value material. If it doesn't offer the same U values, this is the cost over time in terms of environmental performance or energy consumption. 
It then moves through into some of our work that we've been doing around pre-manufactured value and being able to fully understand the cost of a build from day one. This fits in with the UK government's aim and drive to gear everything around a standardized kit of parts. And that doesn't mean standardized design, just it's, a, it's an approach to building, an approach to construction that is far more akin to manufacturing. Interestingly, this moves through to benefits seen throughout the assembly of a project, that componentization. We can understand in, uh, much more robustly in terms of 4D modeling opportunities, where those components are in the logistic and supply chain, what they're made of, where that material has come from, what the embodied energy on that material is. We can understand the full carbon cost of that component. We know when it's on site, we know where it is on site, and we know when it's been put into place. So we're getting a lot more information um, and really trying to sort of imagine and, and, and apply what 4D modeling should be uh, on site. In use and in operation, we're seeing cost savings in maintenance and in decommissioning and disassembly. So if we're going to hit zero waste targets and net zero carbon targets, the notion around disassembly is, is, is really important. It, it provides flex in a building typology, particularly in a housing model. No model and no building typology has to work as hard as housing. Your average house has to last 100 years, or at least the average house in the UK lasts 100 years. There's no other building typology that, that, that we make work that hard. So it, being able to flex and extend and, and grow that typology as families grow, as the family unit changes, as behavior changes in people is incredibly important. Um, we've been doing a number of projects in this space. A lot of our focus, we're very sort of digitally enabled, but a lot of our focus has been around those co-design workshops, um, create, having design sprints and professional um, workshops with stakeholders, with clients, with owners, occupiers, and with occupational uh, professionals who can advise us on those evaluation metrics and criteria that we should be designing to uh, throughout a project and that underpin that project all the way through. It doesn't sound like anything radical. Decide what you want to do with the project at the beginning and stick to it. Um, but it's quite difficult, it would appear, to do that. So this is a uh, scheme called Future Homes. It's the development of 66 unit um, mid to high rise mixed tenure development. Uh, in the centre of Newcastle, in an innovation area of Newcastle that is focused on having at least 10% of its units as being highly experimental and riddled, for want of a better term, with technology so that we can understand what's going in, what's going on and what's going in those spaces at any moment in time. Um, I'll come back to that integration of technology in a moment. We have also been working very hard on trying to reimagine the supply chain and the construction process. We're looking at a social value focused offering around affordable housing. Um, at the minute, this isn't an offsite offering. We've developed the, the principle in concept and we're going to site on three sites later this year with a light gauge steel offering first and then a timber offering. The, the, the crux of this model is that the areas that need housing the most are often the areas that have the highest uh, instances of people not in training or education. They're often the areas of need for more employment. So this entire focus of this project is about creating more local jobs. It's about creating local economic growth, um, about really trying to remedy local issues with the environment and strengthen and make local communities more resilient. So we take a flying factory approach. We take this manufacturing plant to the area. It becomes a training academy. It upskills and trains local people in new modern methods of construction. And then they build the new houses that are there. And this is the only really <coughs> sustainable way we can say, see modern methods of construction really addressing the need for the housing demand in the UK and the housing crisis in the UK. There's another school of thought, which is often adopted by government hence supplying a few large players who we've got good relationships with, with 30 million pounds to explore a volumetric approach. The only issue with a volumetric approach to um, supplying 300,000 homes a year 
is that we do not have the logistics infrastructure within the UK to do that. There are 12 houses that are on an innovation village in the north of England. Three of them required the central motorway to be shut down for a small portion of time, police escorts, a load of bureaucracy around it, and the house itself was sent on three low loaders. The first two were useful. The third was just an empty pitch roof because people want to live in pointy houses. And the carbon cost of doing all of that is absolutely ridiculous. Why have centralized few factories when you can have a flying factory approach that addresses so many more societal needs and issues? So we're very involved in that, in, in this area at the moment. We're looking at that kit of parts, that digital componentized approach. We know exactly how much this house costs. We know where the materials have come from because we've taken more ownership and control in a collaborative way of the supply chain. We're looking at introducing lessons learned that we have on prefab in the healthcare and the education sectors into the housing sector with regards to bathroom and kitchen units. And this approach seems to be getting a bit of traction in the UK. There's now been 30 million allocated to a construction corridor across the Northwest. And this is to refocus um, construction processes around a manufacturing approach across the northwest of England, and this will be the corridor that it all happens on, apparently. At the same time, we're doing a lot of work as a business around the building as a lab and looking at the integration of sensors into the cityscape and the building fabric so that we can understand environmental performance uh, internally and externally and environmental quality. This isn't because we fetishize over data and collecting thousands and billions of data points. It's because if we're going to set out those evaluation criteria at the beginning of a project, we need a quantitative way to measure those. And this sensor integration has proved absolutely invaluable. Newcastle, very fortuitously, is one of the most censored up cities in the UK. Um, this building here is, is, is run by colleagues of ours at the University of Newcastle. It's a, it's a bit of an enigma in the fact that it is the most censored building in the UK. It has 200 people who are, can only describe as being genius. Um, however, they all work independently. And at least three of them in the last six months have all come to our practice and said, we've harvested over a billion data points. Have you got anything we can do with them? Again, this is really important because this is where, the answer is hell yes, of course we have. And we can use that data, but there's no point in collecting data for the sake of collecting data. Uh, we'll use that data to evidence the quantitative evaluation of those success criteria on projects. Um, and it's, this is becoming increasingly prevalent in terms of monitoring air quality in, in different areas. We have another body of work which is around putting sensors into housing association properties to understand the true impact of damp and mold within those properties and being able to forewarn occupants uh, using temperature and humidity sensors um, and provide them with actionable health advice in terms of trying to instigate behavioral change, open a window, turn the heating on, to avoid those damp environments. This platform also provides actionable feedback on a predictive maintenance schedule to owners occupiers to say within your estate, these units are at risk of damp and mold. One of the largest housing associations in the UK, LNQ, spends up to £13 million a year just on remedying damp and mould in their properties in terms of additional maintenance. It does have other benefits to housing associations. You can understand occupancy levels. Um, you can understand the levels of void properties within your estate. And we're also doing some very interesting work at the minute with fire and emergency services on how first responders can use this to better plan uh, emergency response to buildings. This technology is really interesting because we can use it within the workplace as well. Um, this is a, a heavily um, technology enabled client of ours and we delivered this workspace for them full of, full of sensor technology so that they could better understand the environmental performance um, of those spaces and the operational energy performance as well as the energy cost of those spaces. Um, very, very progressive client in that respect. Um, 
and, and we're very thankful to them for allowing us to sort of use that data and, and learn from it. We are doing a lot in the BIM for FM space. Uh, we've done some done a lot of work with key clients, including Sydney Opera House and Hong Kong NTR. This has all been based around saving time per work order. Let's work to the lowest denominator. If these places, and within Sydney Opera House, they have over 20,000 work orders per annum. If we can save 30 minutes per work order, that is a substantial time and cost saving on a project. Um, we, having monitored the project for a couple of years, the average saving that Sydney Opera House is coming to based on, on the model and the work that we've done together is over £450,000 uh, every year, which is a, a saving against their existing or, or traditional maintenance regime of over 7% um, per square metre of maintenance. So by understanding that information, by organising it in a better fashion, we have a much better chance of being able to make things more efficient and make things more productive. We're doing the same on a much larger scale in the construction and manufacture space around design for manufacture and assembly, including some prefab on large scale healthcare projects and healthcare campuses. Um, this is really interesting because this is a client who has an awful lot of money, but needs to make an awful lot of savings as well. Um, and some serious efficiency savings. So every external wall panel on this scheme and a lot of the internal wall panels are all designed for manufacture and pre-manufactured and sent to site. This uh, resulted in some significant cost savings on the project, as did the prefab <coughs> units for ward spaces, surgical spaces, and treatment rooms. Right here on your doorstep, our Vancouver office um, has done some really interesting work around adaptive reuse and retrofit in that space, uh, taking point cloud scans, um, straight to BIM to improve coordination of design interventions and the use of the digital specification platform MBS Chorus that could be linked to the model and also shared with the wider design team. Um, this is a really, we would never have been able to get this level of detail and accuracy with an adaptive reuse project if we hadn't had that process and workflow from point cloud data through to BIM. Uh, we're also exploring internal environment sensors to monitor that building fabric. We have another tranche of research projects um, around net zero carbon and energy modeling and embodied carbon that are underway. But what's really important to mention is that we don't have a massive research team at Ryder. Um, all of our research is project based. We learn on the fly. Uh, we don't have a dedicated research team. Uh, it's more about working with like minded people, progressive businesses and developing that knowledge together. And that inevitably leads to new elements of business growth. So I think just to leave you on a, on a thought, we have set out an agenda within the UK that we've called reinvention. Um, this is off the back of the pharma review and another other, a number of other government reviews. It's all about redefining our industry and the way that we use information in the industry. And key excerpt from that document is that the sentiment is that as an industry, we've spent far, far, far too long just tinkering around the edges uh, and ignoring what's really happening. Uh, we, we need total reinvention at this moment. Uh, the industry is barely fit for purpose. It's certainly woefully inefficient and it's founded on principles of organization that may no longer be as relevant as we think. We spend far too much energy, time and money managing unnecessary divisions and interfaces while also spending way too much energy avoiding responsibility. And effort is often duplicated and errors are always compounded. Um, there's no magic answer. And I'm sorry if I haven't provided a magic answer. But the business as usual approach is absolutely not sustainable. The benefits of improving digital information management are explicitly clear. So I would encourage everyone to embrace forums like CanBIM and the expertise that this forum offers. Build your networks here, expand your knowledge, work collaboratively and work with like-minded partners to try to begin and push the own boundaries of your knowledge. 
It's surprising how quickly that these positive steps have added up in terms of our project expertise and research expertise at Ryder. Thank you very much for your time.